Amen. Amen. And tonight I want to preach a sermon titled, The Blessings of Marriage. The Blessings of Marriage. And the part I want to focus on in Proverbs chapter number 5 is uh, verse number 15, starting in verse number 15. It says, Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And so, the Bible's real clear here. It talks in the beginning of chapter 5 about the, uh, the whorish woman and how you should avoid her, not even go to the door, uh, the steps of her house. You know, don't even look upon her. But, it goes on and it says, here it says, Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. So it's saying, you know, take waters from your own cistern. You know, have something that's your own and not strangers. So right here we see that we need to have a wife in our youth. Our youth is when we need to find a wife and we need to have a wife. You know, our culture here in the United States, it seems to be against marriage. You know, and people, it seems like they get married so late in life. Like they, they go to college and they live out their college years and they get married like in their 30s or something like that. It's like, man, that seems late. You know, I was married at uh, 22, so that's that. I, I was that still seems kind of late to me. I don't know. I, I went through some years of college before I was married, but I mean, I, the Bible's real clear that we should rejoice with the wife of our youth. <clears throat> you know, but you know, the amount of marriages in the United States, you know, is continually kind of dropping. It's on a downward slope. You know, there's about seven people out of a thousand that actually get married. I mean, that's, that's a staggering number, seven out of a thousand. But, uh, you know, I want to show you, you know, the world is really negative about marriage. You know, they, they, they think it's like, a, like a, a chain, a ball and chain. You have to tow it around with you all the time. But, you know, and I'm not talking from a man's perspective. Or I'm just saying in general. It says, you know, I, I want to show you there's blessings associated with marriage straight out of the Bible. And that you should consider, if you're not married, consider finding a wife or a husband, you know. So, uh, speaking to both man and woman here. So, the, the Bible's real clear here in Proverbs 5 that we need to stay away from the whorish woman, the strange woman, you know, uh, that her lips are drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. It's really tempting, right, to, to be sucked into fornication and to... Uh, you know, the sins of this world. But the Bible's real clear that we need to get a wife in our youth. Why do we need to get a wife in our youth? Well, to avoid fornication. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So I'm going to show you one of the blessings of marriage. And uh, I'm going to read a passage in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So God's going to judge people that do go after that strange woman. You know, the whorish woman, uh, women that go after men outside of marriage. God's going to judge those people. But the Bible says marriage is honorable in all. Look down at where I had you turn, 1 Corinthians 7, and pick it up in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So right here, verse 1, it's very clear. It says, see, it's a good for a man not even to touch a woman. Okay, at all. Don't even touch the woman. You know, unless you're married to her, don't touch a woman. But nevertheless, to avoid fornication. So to avoid fornication, what do we need to do? Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Because inside of marriage, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, coming together with your wife. It's just outside of marriage, that is sinful. That is a, a, a grievous sin. We'll see that here, here shortly. Let's keep reading in this passage, though. Verse number 3, it says, Let the husband render unto the, unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. 
Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may be given, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and to and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incon incontinency. You know, you know, once you're once you're married, it's just explaining here that it's not sinful to come together and, and to know your wife, right? I'm not going to go into detail. But the Bible is very clear that outside of marriage, this is a bad thing. And, on, on, and even inside of marriage, if, if you're committing adultery, which is not fornication, adultery is committing uh, whoredoms with someone that is not your wife. Okay, if you're married and you're, you're committing whoredoms with someone that's not your wife, that is adultery. And so that is a bad thing. You know, once you're married, you're, you're to be faithful unto your wife, unto your spouse. Um, so it's very clear in the Bible. Turn with me to First or Second Chronicles chapter 21. Second Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to see how serious it is to, to commit fornication and to commit these whoredoms. Let's see what happens in the Bible. There's, there's things that happen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, Flee fornication. For every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. So, Bible's real, it says flee fornication, that means run from it, turn and run. Don't even get caught, you know, thinking about it. Just run. Get away. Now, here I want to show you the seriousness of fornication. Look down, this is a story in uh, 2 Chronicles 21, and pick it up in verse 11. Verse 11 the Bible says, Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David your father, of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but has walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and has made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also has slain the brethren of thy father's house, which were better than yourselves. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people, and thy children, and thy wives, and thy goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels. Unto thy bowel, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. This is pretty serious, right? The Bible is 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 uh, judging the God is judging people for committing fornication, and he's he's making them sick. He's giving them diseases, right? And we all know this from modern day studies that have been done in, in science, and uh, you know that's just knowledge that we know from statistics that. You know, people that commit fornication are filled with diseases. They have all manner of diseases, whatever they are. Right. And it, it was the same in the Bible day. You know, God is the one giving these people these diseases. And it says in verse 18, it says, And after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. It's an in incurable disease. I mean, what, what diseases can you think of? that are incurable, you know, like HIV, right? right? We, we know that there's other ones too, but, I mean, ju just think about that. He had an incurable disease, but look at what happens to him in the end. In verse 19, it says, And it came to pass that in process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by the reason of the sickness, so he died of sore diseases. And his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. So the thing is, is this guy, he, he ultimately died. Joram uh, is, is the name uh, of the, the king there, the son of Jehoshaphat. But he, uh, Jehoram, and he, he died, he got these diseases. And we know that that is something that you can get when you commit fornication. But how is this a blessing? Well, if you get married, God's going to honor you. If you keep yourself pure, you don't commit fornication, you, you go to the wedding altar pure and you're, you haven't committed uh, fornication or whoredoms with the world and you only know your wife, then you can this can never even happen to you. Uh -huh. You don't have to worry about it. If your wife is pure, is a virgin, then you don't have to worry about it. And inside of marriage, it's not going to happen because God's the one giving these people these diseases. 
he's the one, you know, plaguing these people with sickness unto death. Amen. So, now, there's, uh, you know, other things can uh, greatly happen from committing fornication, you know, disease, one. Uh, it can cause a lot of heartache because people are not, uh, they don't cleave to each other, right? They're just one person after another. And some people aren't, they're, they're, they, they get attached, especially women, right? Women are very emotional. But not only that, think about this. What if you have a ch child out of wedlock, right? Then you have this big battle over whose, whose kid it is or are you going to get married or what's going to happen? You don't know. I mean, think about that. What if you don't even know the person? It's like, man, now you have a child with that person. Or even worse, abortion. What happens then? Because you don't have any, you don't have any say. You're not the husband. So there's lots of bad things that can result from committing whoredoms and uh, committing fornication that are out of your control at that point. Because in, in America today, sadly, women have a choice. You know, that's not biblical. That's murder. Is what it is. Right. It's murder, and it's happening all the time in this country, and it's wicked. You know, and and you don't want to be any part of that. But guess what? You're putting yourself in that position when you go out and you commit fornication. When you go out and you commit these quorums. You put yourself in that situation and then you could be partaker of their evil deeds. You could be partaker of a murder that takes place. Think about it. Think about it. So, number one, you save yourself a lot of heartache. You save yourself uh, you know, a lot of stress and, and, and worrying. You just go to the altar pure, don't fornicate, uh, be, be clean, be a virgin, and get married to your wife. And then, you know, enjoy that pleasure with your wife and your wife only. That's what you should do. So, first off, that's a blessing of marriage. Because the thing is, is obviously not everybody's going to get married, right? I mean, we see that from the statistics. Seven out of a thousand are getting married. That's that's a low number. It's not a lot. But I mean, there is a lot of people in the world, so there is a, still a, a lot of marriages going on. But the thing is, is most people. Some people argue, well, I I don't. I'm not tempted with that, right? Well, that's not everybody, okay? Because the majority of people are tempted with, uh, you know, the opposite gender. I mean, that is a that is a natural affection. That is natural for a man to uh, you know, be attracted to a woman, or a, a woman to be attracted to a man. That's natural. Now, the problem comes in if you're attracted to the same gender. That is unnatural affection. Amen. And that is not something that uh, we, we will tolerate here, for sure. You will not stay in this building if you're attracted to uh, the same gender. But let's look at the second reason that uh, marriage is a blessing. You know, this one is, is a little bit uh, uh, not as much of a blessing, but it's just like a, a, a something you need to know about marriage. Is if you're thinking about getting married, it's like, well, who do I marry? Who should I who should I seek and who should I who should I find? You know. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. <clears throat> I'm going to read 2 Corinthians uh, 6 uh, verse 14. It says, "Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers." For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So this passage in 2 Corinthians is, is talking about uh, being unequally yoked with the world. But we can apply that to being unequally yoked in marriage as well. So if you're saved and you're born again, you know you're on your way to heaven, why in the world would you ever want to go out and see a woman that's unsaved? Unless you're trying to get her saved before you get married. Right? That, there's no problem with that. I mean, amen. Go out, get a girl saved, and then, you know, bring her to church, get married one day. That's awesome. And that would be great. That's, that's actually a good goal. I didn't even have that in my notes. But that, that is something that, that you, can, you can strive to do. But let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 28, where I had you turn, and pick it up in verse number 1. It says, And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, th thy mother's husband, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. 
and God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. So right here, I, I had to turn here because, you know, <clears throat> Jacob was sent out because he was a stranger in a foreign land. And, you know, we can, we can, we can uh, take this and we can, we can apply it to, you know, God doesn't want us to, to, to marry a stranger, somebody that's not a Christian. He wants us to, even if we have to, is make that journey, you know, do what we have to do to find a, a godly wife. So he goes to his own kin, some of his uh, distant kin here, and, and he finds a wife that are of like faith. That's what's going on here. And they, uh, he, he, he travels to do this. We can apply this to, you know, if you're going to find a godly girl where, or a, a man, women, is where are you going to go? You're going to go to church somewhere and you're going to find them. Well, you want to go to a church that believes the right gospel, right? Maybe that church is not very close. I mean, how far do you have to travel to get to a church that preaches the right gospel? You know, because... And even in a church where they preach the right gospel, I mean, there's still people there that aren't saved. Let's face it. Right. There's uh, Judases in all churches. We, we know that. And there's people that aren't saved. So you still have to check the person's salvation. You have to know for sure that they're saved. I mean, but that's not hard to do. If you go soul winning, you know how to check somebody's salvation. Amen. It's pretty easy. So you, you, you travel, you find this church, you go to it. And you, you go there, you, you be a part of it, be a blessing, and then, you know, you can find a wife at a church that has, uh, you know, women in it. You know, that's, that's where you find a wife, or women, you find a, a husband at these churches. There's, there seems to be a lot of, of men in, in our movement at these, uh, these, these churches that we go to. But it, it, I've been seeing more ladies here, here lately. I mean, that's, that's the truth. I mean, it's a, it's a great thing. Families move all the time, and they become a part of the church, and they have children. So that's another another way. So we need to find a wife that's not a stranger. You know, you're not you're not finding a wife that's of the strangers in the land. You want to find somebody that's of like faith, somebody that has the same beliefs as you. Because if you get married to an unbeliever, man, it's going to cause all kinds of uh, budding heads. You're going to want to go to church, and then you're going to have kids, and you know, you're know pulling them back and forth between what you believe and whatnot. It's, it would be a headache. And there's a lot of families out there that are like that. I, I, I know personally some people that the woman's saved, and the husband's not, and it's just, it's hard for that woman. And then vice versa, the husband's saved and the woman's not. You know, And, and sadly, a lot of times, that will even end up in divorce. But divorce is not... Biblical. We know that for right. a fact. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The, uh, marriage is for life, and that's that's a fact. So it's not right. It's legal in our country, so people do it. But the thing is, uh, Proverbs chapter thirty-one <clears throat> says in verse ten it says, "Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her." So that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. So, obviously, guys, what you want to do is find a virtuous woman. You know, her, her price is far above rubies. I mean, I don't even have any rubies. <laughs> but I have, I have a good wife. You know, a virtuous wife. So that's good. I mean, I, I've been blessed with my wife. There, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't say this, but I, the reason I'm kind of preaching this is I, my anniversary is coming up this next week. You know, that's why I, I kind of focus this message on marriage. But I've been married for seven years coming up this uh, Tuesday, the 23rd. So, you know, we'll be, we'll be married for seven years. And, you know, I, I've seen some of these blessings in marriage. And so that's why I want to share them with you. But, but, but men, you want to find this virtuous woman because her price is far above rubies. You don't have to worry about what's going on. You know, she's going to do you good and not evil all the days of your life. And so you don't, you, you don't have to worry about things. There's other things to worry about in this life. We shouldn't worry, but we do. We're sinful people. And so that's one that you don't want to be worrying about all the time. So the thing is, 
And, and women, women, you know, you want to find a man that's not a derelict. So women, you want to find somebody that has a job, first off. I mean, of course, you want the man to be saved, you know, going to church. But he needs to at least have a job. You know, he can support you. He may have, uh, he may be just working on finding a place to say, he may not have his own place right now, but hey, that's a start. He has a job, he's, he's earning money. And, you know, someone that you can follow because we're going to see later on that marriage has to be in order. But number, number three, point number three, let's turn to Psalm chapter 127. Psalm chapter 127. So once you find this person and you get married, you know, you stay pure and you avoid fornication, you know, what's next? What, what do you do next? You know, you get married, what are some of these other blessings? Well, the Bible's real clear. When you get married, you know, that you're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. The Bible says in Genesis 128, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and re replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So this is in Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. You know, this is what I have to say to all those people that are down on marriage and, and down on, uh, you know, having children is, man, I, if your mother didn't want to have kids, I mean, man, where would you be? You wouldn't even be here. Amen. That's what I have to say. I, I mean, and the thing is, is we need to be fruitful, we need to multiply, and especially, especially Christians, especially people that, that know the truth, they know the gospel, and we need to multiply ourselves. I mean, literally, that's what you're doing when you have children. You know, you go soul winning, and you 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 get people saved. You you you, you get that fruit, and you bring it unto everlasting life. And but you never see them come to church. Sometimes you do, right? And and hopefully these people do end up finding their way to a church somewhere. But the thing is, it's with physical fruit, physical children, you can drag them to church. <laughs> You can drag your children to church, and they're going to listen because you're going to make them listen. Yeah. You know, and, you know, the Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. So, the ch the physical fruit are a blessing. Look down at, at, at Psalm 127, verse 3. It says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Now again, look, it's saying youth, right? The wife of thy youth. Children of the youth. Are we seeing a theme here? Right? We're supposed to get married, you know, at a, at a young age. We're not supposed to wait until we're, we're financially secure, and we can support somebody, Amen. right? Marriage is a, is a step of faith, just like, just like you know, uh, you know, Anything else? You, you you can't you can't have all your ducks in a row and then and then expect it and it won't be there later in life. You know, all the virtuous women are gonna be gone. <laughs> you need to find that woman in your youth, and you need to uh, you know have children in your youth. It says that they're an heritage of the of the of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. So God is rewarding that marriage with children. And they're an heritage of the Lord. So, so I mean, they're, they're going to grow up. If you raise them up right, they're going to know right from wrong. They're going to know the gospel. They're going to know Bible doctrines. And, you know, when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. Guess what? They're going to keep this cycle going. Keep it going. I mean, how do you think we've gotten here from the time of Jesus Christ all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Adam? You know, it's a, it's a, we've entered into other men's labors, wherein you have not labored. You know, this... It's, been, it's an ongoing cycle of people that have done this. And we need to continue it. Amen. So the thing is, here, if you keep reading, it says, Happy is the man that hath this quiver full of them. The quiver is something you hold arrows in, right? Pull the arrow out. Shoot the arrow. It says, They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, I've always liked that into that passage there, <clears throat> because you train this child up, right? And it, it, anybody you know that really knows the Bible, that the Bible will make you smarter. Now think about children, man. If you train up a child that reads the Bible and knows the Bible from a young age, children are going to be very smart. 
And the gate was always a place of like the power and where where they would uh, the judges, the rulers, they would they would it, they would uh, decide on laws and things. That's what he's talking about. The Bible says that they, your children, are going to speak with the enemies in the gate. All right. So they're they're like arrows in the hands of a mighty man. An arrow is something that does some damage. Right. These children that you're raising up, you train them up right. Uh, they're going to be as arrows. They're going to be they're going to be uh, arrows going spear and right into you know the devil's army. Right? They're going to be making some damage in time to come when they grow up and you have a, this soul winning army. Right? Because if you're fruitful and you multiply, you replenish the earth. You're not going to just do that with one child. You know, you're going to have more than one child. Right? You're going to have, you know, hopefully, you know, a dozen children. Or as in the Bible, you know, they blessed, uh, I think it was Rebecca said, beat out the mother of thousands of millions. <laughs> it's funny. I can't remember if I'm right there. But it says, it does say that. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. That's a, that's a strong prayer. Is, uh, for, to have that many children. That's a lot. But uh, I come from a big family. My my great-grandmother, she had 16 children. That wasn't, that wasn't very uncommon back, back then, though. You know, a lot of people had big families. You know, it was pretty, like, like major birth control you know I mean birth control has been around for a long time since Egypt you know they say but uh, it wasn't a very well practiced thing in the United States you know because people preached the Bible Amen. and they preached against you know murder so these people had a fear of God and my family they, they you know the majority of them were saved my grandmother she was she was a hundred percent safe I knew her she lived to be uh, I believe 93 93 years old. She was a, she was a great lady, and she outlived. You know, all all our children are, are. I think all of our children are still alive. I have such a big family. They're all my great aunts and uncles because my great grandmother. But uh, we have family reunions, and we just rent out a whole camp. You know, and I don't even know everybody. I go to these things, and it's like, how you doing? You know. So, but but you know, she knew. She knew them all. She knew them all. She would remember people's names. And when she got older, she had Alzheimer's real bad. But uh, she was a blessing. I, I picture my grandmother. She's, she's uh, you know, sitting in heaven right now in a rocking chair. That's how I picture her. She, she loves to sit in a rocking chair. But, um, you know, be fruitful. She had, she had a very blessed life because she had all of those children, you know. And you can raise these children up, and they're going to they're gonna do you good if you raise them up the right way. So, you know, we ought to lead by example. You know, you can't just be a uh, say and do not. You know, you have to lead your children and your family by example. So you, as the husband, need to be the leader. You know. Um, so let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. So that's a blessing in marriage, is having that reward of having physical fruit from God. The thing is, you know, not everybody's going to have children. I need to address this because you know, some people think, well, they're not being rewarded by God because they don't have children. You know, I don't know if that's the case. Maybe it is. But the thing is, if you can't have children, well, you're still married. You still have a soul winning partner for life. You know, because I find it hard sometimes to find a soul winning partner. My son's to the age now where I can just take him with me. So I don't find that hard anymore. But when you're, when you have like one or two kids that are real small, and you know you go to a church that doesn't do a lot of soul winning you only got a few people it's hard to find somebody to go you go out soul winning alone a lot it's like it's better to have that camaraderie somebody to go out soul winning with so that's a blessing right there in itself is you have somebody that you can you can share experiences with you can go out you can win souls you can you know live a fulfilling life with your wife so and you can have eternal children right you can have so to speak not literally, not Mormon or anything. No, you can have you can have children that you begat in the Lord. Amen. Right? You gave them the gospel and they got saved. Number four, I had you turn to uh, Genesis chapter two, and this point is just you know marriage is a good thing overall. You know people like to downplay marriage, give it a bad name, cast shade on marriage, but marriage is a good thing. It's a big responsibility for a husband and wife. Look down at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. 
It says, And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and of every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was, his, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to the beasts of the field. But for Adam there was not found and helped meat for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of, the rib, one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So we see here in this passage, you know, it's not good for the man that he be alone. Alright? Because he doesn't have somebody to be a helpmeet unto him. Uh, also, he, he can be tempted to, like I said in the first point, to commit fornication, or just to be idle. Right? When you're married, there's always something to do. You, especially if you follow the second one and you have kids. You always have something to do with kids. There's never a dull moment. So, <clears throat> you, uh, there's always something to do. And the wife is there to help the husband. And it, it's, it's not good that the man should be alone. According to the Bible, this is Genesis chapter 2. I mean, this is in the beginning. Right. This is, people, a lot of people have read this. You know, they crack open the Bible and they're like, I'm going to start right here. <laughs> They've seen this. They've seen it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 says, Whoso, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. <clears throat> so Proverbs is real clear that if you find a wife, you found a good thing. And not only that, but you've obtained favor of the Lord. So, I mean, that, that right there in itself just shows you that marriage is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's spelled out plain and clear right there in the Bible. And, and how, I mean, there you're going to obtain favor with God just by just by finding a wife. So God wants you to have a wife. He wants you to get married. He wants you to, you know, be fruitful and multiply the earth. So you know, it's something I, I believe people should do. Men should find a wife. I mean, ladies, they don't really, they're not supposed to go out and find a husband. The husband's supposed to find them. That's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> Today's world is a little backwards. <clears throat> but... Whatever, the world is backwards in a lot of it. So, but it says in verse 24, it says, Therefore shall the man leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So they're going to cleave together. <clears throat> they're going to be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So, <clears throat> it's real clear in the Bible, in the very beginning, it's not good that the man should be alone. It, it, finding a wife is a good thing and it obtains you favor with the Lord. So, <clears throat> my last point, my last point is, uh, is, you know, there has to be an order to, to your marriage. There has to be an order to your marriage. And because if you're going to have happiness in marriage, it has to be done the right way. You can't just get married and just go by, you know, Dr. Phil's book on marriage. Right. It's not going to, it's not going to go good. I mean, that guy is law, fell off the rock there. So, turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> we'll look at some Bible on this. It says, you know, in 1 Timothy 5, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So again, the younger women marry. So the younger women, again, talking about young, but they bear children right after they marry, saying, bear children, right? Guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So, this is going to keep the woman busy. You know, and that's that's something good, you know, for women to be busy doing something. Because uh, women can get a little chatty sometimes. We know that for a fact. But the thing is, is uh, in today's world, everybody gets like that with all the modern technology and, uh, you know, the social media. People just, like, they're all about other people's business. You know, that's just how it is. Man, woman, everybody. You know, not everybody. People, so there's some people that don't do that. So, look down at Colossians chapter three. <clears throat> Colossians chapter three. 
says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So right here in Colossians chapter 6, we can kind of see an order here. You know, the wife is submitting unto the husband, as is fit in the Lord. The husband's loving the wife. The children obey the parents. So, you know, the wife, the husband's at the head, right? The Bible often compares the church. You know, Christ is the head. He's the Savior of the body. And the church, so the Christ is the head of the church. Then you have a, an over, overseer, right, which is the pastor of the church. So he is, is, you know, watching over the flock, so to speak. And then the, the church is like the wife, the bride. Some people would say, you know, that's how that's how they would determine. I don't know where I was really going with that, but here the, the wife submits to the husband, and then the children obey the parents. So there is an order there. Uh, I had another place I wanted you to turn. Turn to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five. So Genesis chapter three. It actually, in the beginning, when God created the man and the woman, you know, the woman was be to help help the, the husband. And it says in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, after the fall of man, it says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So the man is in the authority in the, in the marriage. He's the head of the house, and rightly so, he should be the head of the house. The wife should be under him and should submit unto him. In Ephesians chapter 5, I had you turn to verse 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. That's why I was thinking about that, because I knew we were going to turn here. But the thing is, is we see that picture because... Uh, we're supposed to love our wives as husbands. We need to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing the water of water by the word. So we need to uh, love our wives, cherish our wives, so that... Uh, you know, doesn't the devil can't speak reproach, reproach, reproachfully against us? And if we keep reading, it says, "For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it, nourish and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh." Remember, it said that in Genesis as well, Genesis chapter two, man shall be uh, leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be, they too shall be one flesh. So they say, you know, you're not going to hate your own flesh. You're not going to be bitter against it, but you need to love and cherish it, cherish it, and strengthen your wife, you know, where she's lacking, you know, teach her, right? Uh, the Bible even says, you know, the woman's not supposed to speak in the church, but let her ask her husband at home, right? So if your wife doesn't know something, she comes to you and she asks you, you know, teach your wife, love your wife. You know, as Christ loved the church. Christ died for the church. You should be willing to die for your wife, for your family. You know, that's that's what you should do, specifically for your wife. You know, uh, because, I mean, it's bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. You know, you should, you should, that's how much you should love your wife. Amen. That's the example we're given. And then it says, uh, in verse number 32, it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let one, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So we need to love our wife even as ourself, and the wife needs to reverence the husband. So she needs to uh, you know, submit unto the husband, do what he says, and uh, but in return, you know, the husband's supposed to be loving. He's not going to ask his wife to do something you know, crazy. That she, I mean, maybe she doesn't want to do it. Maybe... If the husband's right in what's going on, what needs to be done, then you know the, the wife needs to listen to the husband. 
for sure. You know, if if the husband is, is being, uh, you know, nitpicky about something, still the wife should reverence her husband and do that thing. But the husband should love the wife and should not be, uh, like, crazy demanding about things. You're supposed to love your wife, cherish your wife, right? Especially when she is, uh, you know, guiding the house, ruling over her children. I mean, she's having to... Uh, Raise, raise your children. I mean, if you're a, a working husband, I mean, which you should be, you know, you're out working all day. Your wife's at home with the kids. It's a lot of work. You know, it's a big responsibility, like I said, to be married, <clears throat> to be a husband or to be a wife is a huge responsibility. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the marriage, you know, the husband is the leader of the house. And guess who's going to, you know, who's going to be, uh, you know, to blame? If the house is not in order, you know, the husband has a huge responsibility as the head of the house to have his house in order and to raise up his children right, because he's the one that's going to be held accountable, right? Because he's the head. He's the one that's going to have to answer, just like you know the pastor is going to have to answer for that church that's unruly, the church that doesn't go so well, right? The same thing, the husband's going to have to answer for the family that doesn't go to church. The family that doesn't read the Bible. The family that, you know, is, you know, disobedient, unruly. So, <clears throat> the thing is, is there's a lot of blessings to being married. It's a huge responsibility, but it's something that God wants you to do. He wants you to get married. Number one, marry to avoid fornication. Most people are tempted with this sin. And so, you know, get married young. You know, get married, stay pure until marriage. And avoid fornication. Number two, you know, marry someone of a like faith, someone that believes the same way as you do. Believe, uh, you know, by grace through faith, and you know, and marry, and then be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. You know, bring forth that physical fruit that's going to grow up and be a heritage unto the Lord. So, and then uh, number four is marriage is a good thing. Don't let the world fool you and say you know marriage is bad and. Don't get married. You know, you hear you can hear the proverbial friends in the background. Oh, you're getting married. What are you getting married for? You know, it's like, no, that's not the case. The Bible says if you find a wife, you found a good thing. And you obtain favor with the Lord. And then last off is, you know, a good marriage has to be in the proper order. The proper order because if your marriage isn't in that proper order, <clears throat> then it's not going to be a happy marriage. It's going to be not what you need you know we need to follow the bible what it says this is our this is our instruction manual to life so we need to read it we need to follow it and do what it says and uh you know marriage is a blessing and there's a lot of blessings associated with marriage let's go to the lord in prayer dear lord just thank you for this day just thank you for uh everyone that showed up to the church service tonight i just uh, pray that you bless them for being here i hope they they got something out of the message and they understand that marriage is a blessing from you, Lord, and uh, that we need to uh, find a wife and uh, replenish this earth and train up children. <clears throat> Do all these things, Lord, uh, for your honor and glory. Just uh, give us safe travels home. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's uh, turn